China. In recent history, a land of alleged human rights violations, and over the latter course of the 20th century and the earlier course of the 21st century, rising from the shadow of the Soviet Union to become the main competition of America. But this isn't what China is, this isn't what China always was, and it is a land steeped in history. From fending off Mongol invasions to the various dynasties that ruled over it at various times, over ever-changing territories, and of course pirates. Apologies for any um, fireworks in the background. Um, it's, I'm recording this on New Year's Eve. Of the pirates that you've most likely heard of in history, None of them can really hold a candle to who we're going to discuss today. At the height of this person's power, they commanded a force of 70,000 men and humiliated the navies of at least three major powers. Qing Shi, the pirate queen of the South China Sea. <laughs> But before we get into the bulk of the video, I would like you to shush for a second while we quickly go over our sponsors. The sponsors, of course, being me, because I'm going to milk this joke until I start getting sponsors. <laughs> Firstly, you can check out my Patreon. Secondly, if you like Celtic mythology, feel free to check out my book. It's on Amazon. Um, yeah, it's in script format if you like that. Thirdly is the merch store, which feel free to check out. I'm just, I'm not doing another joke about rubbing my moustache on people again because I am... I'm pretty convinced that very soon I'm going to start getting fan fictions. Lastly, the best way to support me is just to like, subscribe, and share my content so that other people get to see it, and we can grow this glorious historical community. Anyways, shh, because daddy's talking. Now, when I first heard the story of the Pirate Queen of the South China Sea, I was enthralled and even made a couple of historical simp videos about her on my TikTok. Yet, looking deeper at the sources, I discovered something deeply worrying. According to westernized versions of the story, Ching Shi punched Cheng Yi, the man she would marry, in the face and demanded 50% of his fleet. Now, someone who has written his entire life was noted as a good storyteller whilst at uni. I like that. And that's a problem. Ching Shi's story sounds so amazing, yet bizarre, because it is, at least in part, a story. There isn't actually that many sources for her in China. In fact, Zhang Baozai, or Chang Pao, is actually mentioned more. Where Ching Shi, or Zhang Yisao, is simply not mentioned as much in these stories, it means that chunks of the story simply aren't true. My disappointment is immeasurable and my day is ruined now the first issue we come up against is the three original sources for ching shi all have a bias and none of those biases are pro a powerful female pirate <laughs> a british source is written to make the british look better and blame the success of the pirates on the incompetence of the portuguese and the corruption of the ching navy there's then also a Portuguese source that's written to make the Portuguese look good and lay the blame on the Qing Navy. There's then also a Chinese source to make the Qing Navy look less corrupt. This Chinese source then gets a mistranslation into English, then gets a reinterpretation, followed by a total fabrication written by Joseph Gollum. Ultimately, if you would like a deeper look at the discrepancies in the Western versions of the story, I deeply recommend Uncovering Zheng Yisao's Ching Shi, Historical Distortion in the West with Larry Fain. For now, let's get on with the story, and remember... Please take it with a pinch of salt. 
Ching Chi was born around 1771, somewhere in South China, most likely in Kwantung province. Her name at this time was possibly Shi Yang, but it would change when she married the pirate lord Cheng Yi, or Zheng Yi. She would become known as Cheng Yi Sao, or Zheng Yi Sao. Spoilers. Throughout the video, I probably will stick to referring to her as Ching Shi, as it's the name I've heard the most, and it's the one I have the best chance of pronouncing correctly without offending a good chunk of people. <laughs> the nation this young woman would grow up in in the latter part of the 18th century was a China ruled by the Qing dynasty. However, the nation at this time was undergoing a massive population boom, which meant that farmers had less arable land to well, farm. As various trades began to be affected by this population boom, people began to look for different ways to provide for themselves and their families. However, history has an odd way of fitting things into place, and many of these pirates would find themselves employed in Vietnam during the Tay Song Rebellion in 1792. They were mainly employed specifically by the Nguyen brothers, and I hope I pronounced that correctly. <laughs> the youngest of the brothers became the Vietnamese Emperor Wan Trung. They managed to beat out the rival Li dynasty, but this rebellion had come at a great cost to the Vietnamese navy. However, hiring pirates as privateers obviously helped to alleviate the problem. Some of the strategies of the pirates at this time consisted of setting fire to smaller ships and then just pushing them towards the enemy, and we well, get how that works. The pirates also had 15 to 30 foot poles with a machete on the end to whack people from a good distance. I've got one of those as well, but mine doesn't have a machete on the end. False. That is incorrect information. They would always use. They would also use a simple clay pot filled with gunpowder as a form of grenade. And my personal favourite. An eight foot long musket that required three people to fire. Brilliant. Like most women born into poverty at the time, Ching Shi ended up working as a courtesan. But she wasn't entirely powerless though, and for every part she was beautiful, she was intelligent. And she used that to advance herself. However, social mobility was something incredibly hard to achieve at this time, as China, like most of the world, was incredibly male-dominated. Yet, there was a world that was ironically favourable for women. In fact, piracy in the South China Sea actually seems to be a lot less male-dominated than, say, uh, the Pirates of the Caribbean. Of course, this newfound power balance roared the waves, and Cheng Yi would rise to become an incredibly powerful pirate lord. Now, this is the man that Ching Shi would come to marry, but as I said earlier, we don't entirely know how they met. Some sources say that Ching Shi went out of her way to organise their meeting. Other sources say that Cheng Yi sought out Ching Shi. Both sides did stand to gain from the marriage as Ching Shi was young, beautiful and intelligent. And Cheng Yi was an incredibly powerful pirate lord coming from a long line of powerful pirate lords. However, whatever the story, they would marry and she would become known as Cheng Yi Sao or Zheng Yi Sao. But she refused to be stuck ashore waiting for her husband to return from his many adventures. She also refused to only be available for late night snuggles. Ching Shi wanted to be his number two. Her closeness to Cheng Yi meant that she, above everyone else, was privy to his thoughts and strategies for the pirates of the South China Sea. As stated earlier, life on the sea was a smidge more receptive to a woman in power, However, Cheng Yi's own prestige and power probably helped her become more accepted by the other pirates. In 1801, the son of a fisherman named Chang Pao, or Zhang Bao, would be captured by Cheng Yi and his pirates. Cheng Yi would bring him into the fold by... hugging him from behind. This behaviour was common among seafarers across the globe, because when you're at sea, any hole's a goal. <laughs> The pirate couple would put him in charge of a junk and legally adopt him, but this was just to make sure that he had inheritance rights. This was because piracy in the South China Sea was a far more hereditary position than it was with more Western pirates. As the boy grew older, it became clear that Ching Shi was, um, 
also looking after him. Now the two people that raised Chang Pao and gave him an education in spit roasting began to turn their eyes to Vietnam, where the Tay Song forces had just been defeated. The Chengs managed to take these directionless pirates and organised them into six large fleets. These fleets were known as the Red, Black, White, Green, Blue and Yellow fleets. In total, this gigantic force would number around 400 ships and 70,000 men, with the Red Fleet being the largest and most powerful. Now, this victory was obviously not Chengi's alone, and apparently the mastermind behind the entire plan was Ching Shi. Much like Grace O'Malley, Ching Shi would become a widow, and as accepting as the pirates had so far been, she needed to move quickly. Firstly, she had to ensure she had an easy way of ensuring her legitimacy as the leader of all of these fleets. And she did this by marrying her adopted son, Chang Pao. Secondly, she then placed her adopted son husband as the commander of the Red Fleet. Then lastly, she secured the allegiance of her husband's two most powerful chieftains, Chen An Pang and Chen Pao Yang. These events could also be attributed to Chang Pao, so again, pinch of salt. Whoever was the main brainchild behind these schemes, they allowed the pirate couple to receive the continued loyalty of the pirate fleet. Now you can't tell the story of Ching Shi without the pirate code, but beware, sources attribute it directly to Ching Shi and directly to Chang Pao. With that said, this is the version of the pirate code that I read attributed to Ching Shi. One, Orders should follow a strict top-down chain of command. Any pirates found to be giving their own orders or disobeying the orders of Ching Shi or Chang Pao would be beheaded on the spot. Two, any raid or business transaction had to be vetted by Ching Shi. Now, with the might of the Red Fleet behind her, Ching Shi pretty much had control of everything that happened even on individual junks. Each crew would only get to keep about 20% of their booty and the rest would be put into a public fund, which if you were caught stealing from, your head would be removed from your body. Ching Shi, the, uh, the pirate who liked taxes. Three, women captured on raids should suffer no harm. Now, this gets a bit convoluted because any good looking captives were often sold into slavery. The ugly ones were let go, but the main point of this rule was if a pirate forced himself upon a woman during or after a raid, he would have his head removed from his body, which, fair to be honest, but this punishment was still applicable to consensual sex, except both parties would have their heads removed. However, this punishment could be avoided if the pirate agreed to marry the woman and be faithful to her for the rest of their lives. For you could harm no villagers. This was because Ching Shi used a lot of villages as allied supply bases. If you were found to have harmed one of the allied villagers, you would be tickled with a feather. Except the feather was a sword, and the tickling was your head falling on the floor. Five, if you deserted or went AWOL, you would have your ears cut off and be paraded in front of your fellow crewmates. Now, as you can tell, Beheading may have been a favourite of Ching Shi, but other punishments did include flogging, clamping in irons, and quartering. According to the fourth officer Richard Glasspool from the captured ship the Marquis of Ely, he was held captive for about four months and forced to survive on caterpillars and rice. He also stated that the Chinese natives that were caught by the pirate crews were given the choice to either join the pirate crews or be flogged to death. If European mariners were caught, they were then forced to assist in coastal attacks. Glasspool also reported various members of the pirate crew taking the heads of their victim and tying them together using pigtails. Now, while witnessing all of this and surviving on a diet of caterpillars and rice, Glasspool was allegedly one of Ching Shi's favourites. This was because his gunnery skill meant he could operate cannons. She also allegedly sprinkled garlic water on him before every battle, believing that he was good luck. And we can believe all of this because Glaspool said it. 
Now, despite these apparent barbarities, the pirates were actually incredibly religious. So, out of the kindness of his own heart, Chang Pao built a magnificent temple aboard one of his ships. Now, to calm the nerves of the men underneath them, Chang Pao and Ching Shi would often visit the temple and burn incense and ask the priests what the gods thought of the upcoming battles. Gods and the priests always looked favourably upon Ching Shi's and Chang Pao's plans. Um... And you could be forgiven for thinking that they must have gone ahead and rigged the results. Now, from 1807 to 1810, the Qing would employ 270 junks, taking salt from Tan Pai to Canton. Now, at this point, Qing Shi saw an opportunity to expand her empire into the salt trade. She deployed a squadron into Tan Pai itself and Nao Chao Island, one of her favourite hideouts. These squadrons then assaulted the ships carrying the salt and captured the salt and the ships transporting it. Eventually, this would leave the Qing with only four ships under their control. The captured crews could still make their sails and hold the salt, but now a large portion of the profits fell into the hands of the pirate queen. Think of it as um, an extremely hostile takeover. With this, the pirates pretty much came the de facto decision makers of the South China Sea. Merchants saw the Qing Navy as completely useless because they would often leave their ships in harbour citing poor weather conditions rather than face off against the pirates. No thanks, I choose life. In 1808, the military commander of Chekiang province was sent with a force of 134 ships to Kwantung province. This was a desperate attempt to deal with the pirates that had so far run rings around the Qing forces in the South China Sea. The Qing navy would then be forced to go up against Qing Shi between July 1808 and July 1809, particularly in the river delta between Portuguese-controlled Macau and Canton. In the first of these two battles, which lasted 16 hours, the Qing navy suffered a horrific defeat, and the Qing admiral committed suicide after the event. In the next battle, Qing Shi had her men swim towards the Qing ships, board them, capture them, and then torched the coastal towns. This became a little bit of an occurrence, and in August, the village of San Shan would see 80 of its inhabitants executed. In September, on Tao Chao Island, another 1,000 people would also sadly lose their lives. In fact, the so-called Campaign of Terror would end up claiming the lives of 10,000 people. Hey, it's history people did shady shit. Ching Shi, with her personal fleet of three ships, manned by 1,422 men and containing over 200 cannons, often organised her larger fleets into powerful formations more akin to giant floating fortresses. Ching Shi's power really only grew, and in September of 1809, she even managed to capture two Portuguese ships. Ching Shi used the momentum she had caused in 1809 to send the city of Canton into absolute panic, by placing a notice on the city's notice board. The notice stated that the gigantic pirate fleet was on its way to attack. The actual message behind this was clear. It was basically, join me or going full Shrek. This is the part where you run away. All along the coast, Ching Shi would then set up financial offices, particularly in Canton and Macau. Of course, the pirates had always accepted money for them to leave you alone, but now there was official documentation letting them know that your toll had been paid to the pirates. This money was then reinvested into the fleet. Ching Shi then managed to build herself a massive spy network involving farmers and fishermen. This spy network then grew to include secret societies, bandits, and even government officials. Government corruption. I am shook if. For legal reasons, that's a joke. And you may be wondering what happened to the general sent to specifically deal with Ching Shi and her pirates. Well, he was killed in battle, and 63 of the Ching Navy ships were sunk. Finally, with no real naval opposition, Ching Shi just began to harass the coastal fortifications and the coastal garrisons. Ching Shi would engage these positions from a great distance away using a barrage of cannon fire. Whilst those on the coastline frantically tried to defend themselves, she would send forward smaller junks, which would land, and then storm the fortifications almost unopposed. At this point, at the height of its power, the fleet of many colours 
pretty much went unchallenged. Yet the ambitious leader began turning her eyes to richer booties. Ships carrying cargoes that most wouldn't dare assault. Ching Shi allegedly was about to make her final play. Ramping up her operations against Siam, Portugal, the East India Company, and the United States, Ching Shi would capture the five aforementioned schooners in September of 1809. Ching Shi and Chang Pao would also capture the Portuguese governor of Timor's brig, whilst also ransoming an entire tribute mission from Siam. At this point, Ching Shi had been forcing various Western cargo ships, particularly the East India Company, to pay her taxes. This made the navies of the various powers affected eager to help the Qing, but the Qing always refused. Finally realising how serious the threat the pirates were, the Qing began to view them as rebels. At this point, the Qing pretty much acknowledged that the pirates had become so powerful that the battles with them had become more akin to a civil war. Finally, the emperor began to negotiate with the Western powers, which led Portugal to send six man of war, and the East Empire Company would send the ship. Ching Shi eventually saw her fleets beginning to become outnumbered and falling behind technologically. And as my mum said when we was watching Jessica Ennis Hill at the height of her career, it's better to retire a winner than to be forced out of the game. On the 26th of December, 1809, Ching Shi and Chang Pao would attempt to get the Portuguese to change sides. Chang Pao sent a letter to the commander of the Portuguese fleet asking for three or four man of war. In return for the Portuguese aid, Chang Pao promised that the emperor would be toppled and the Portuguese commander would be rewarded with two or three provinces in China. It didn't work, but fair play. As the situation began to worsen, betrayal loomed over Ching Shi and Chang Pao. Kupa Tai the leader of the Black Flag Fleet was jealous of Chang Pao's relationship with Ching Shi. This culminated when he flat out refused to help Chang Pao in a battle with a combined Qing and Portuguese fleet. Chang Pao responded by attacking him, forcing Ku Po Tai to surrender to Qing authorities. Finally, on the 21st of February 1810, Ching Shi and Chang Pao met with Pai Lang, the Governor General of Liang Quang Territory, and Miguel José de Agrera, a Portuguese official from the Macau colony. I know I definitely mispronounced at least one of those, so I'm sorry. <laughs> the terms were simple. In return for dismantling their fleets, Ching Shi wanted a total pardon for herself. On top of this, all those under her would also receive pardons. Chang Pao and various other loyal leaders would also receive official positions. Now all was fine until Ching Shi listed her last condition. She wished for herself and Chang Pao to retain a tiny force of 80 ships and 5,000 sailors. Pai Ling, for obvious reasons, didn't really want the two people who had terrorised the South China Sea to retain any real naval presence, so he was obviously hesitant which stalled negotiations. Determined to see the safety of her children and her husband, Ching Shi walked into Pai Ling's quarters on the 8th of April 1810. With her, only the wives and children of some of her captains. She was also unarmed. She then added 40 junks to the deal and just wouldn't accept no for an answer. Pai Ling eventually relented and a few days later would meet Ching Shi to sign the agreement. <laughs> Chang Pao ended up becoming a lieutenant colonel in the Qing army, being promoted to colonel quickly after. Ching Shi went from pirate queen to the respectable wife of a rising imperial officer, becoming known as Ming Sao. Her adopted son husband would then leave the world in 1822, allegedly during a storm. After his death, Ching Shi moved back to Kwantung province and opened a gambling house, with perhaps the greatest twist of irony in history being this gambling house also doubled as a brothel. Some accounts state that Ching Shi actually got back into the salt trade in her later years, this time legitimately. And I do think it's amazing that in a society that was so male-dominated, Ching Shi would rise to become one of the most powerful figures in history. Even though you should still take a lot of the story with a pinch of salt. Ching Shi wouldn't just settle down to die though, and in 1839 she would advise Qing officials on matters of warfare on the sea during the First Opium War against the British. However, at the same time, it's also suggested that she was involved in opium smuggling. And after this last FU, 
to the powers that be, Ching Shi died peacefully in her sleep in 1840. See you in the next one, guys. Bye. Thank you.